Hi, and uh, welcome to the Light Review podcast series. Uh, today we're working with the Lighting Industry Association, uh, looking at their latest uh, offering in terms of photometric testing. Now, um, my name is John Bullock. I'm the editor and publisher of the Light Review. And for those of you who may have missed it, I'm also a lighting designer. And the one thing that we know, uh, and it's the one thing that people will ask is, how do I know? You're putting this, these ideas, you're putting this design in front of me. How do I know that it's going to work? Well, how do any of us know? Uh, unless we've actually got it out of the box and switched it on and seen it, the only way that we can know whether something is going to work is to have the data. And where does that data come from? That data has to come from the photometric labs who are testing the fixtures to see what they do and how they do it. And this is where we are with the LIA. And this is what the LIA's new uh, photometric testing facility is going to give. It's going to give us confidence in the things that we specify. Um, Richard Hayes has got a very particular view on the way that he sees the testing world. And those of you who know Richard, I'm sure you'll agree with that. And those of you who don't know Richard, we'll certainly find out about that in the next half hour. So um, you're going to be listening to Richard Hayes, the director of 42 Partners, who's been working with the Lighting Industry Association. We have Tariq Malik, who's the head of compliance at the LIA to, to introduce the whole thing. And then we're going to be joined by Stephen Biggs, who's technical manager at Tamlight. And of course, Tamlight's a manufacturer and Tamlight is a perfect customer, apart from the fact that they're both in Telford, uh, a perfect customer for the LIA. So whatever Steve has got to say around this, I think is worth listening to. So I'm now going to hand over to Tarek and I'm going to enjoy this presentation and I'll see you out the other end. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, John. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Tarek Malik. I'm the head of uh, compliance here at the uh, LIA. Um, so just to give you a, a brief uh, outline of uh, what we do here and uh, what the LI laboratory is all about. Um, so basically a bit of background on here. Um, here at the LIA, we've got a fantastic state-of-the-art uh, testing facility um, that was uh, catered solely for the lighting industry. Uh, the laboratory opened back in 2016 with the help of a regional growth fund and uh, houses a, a whole range of uh, equipment um, dedicated just for um, lighting testing. Um, as well as the equipment, uh, we've got uh, a whole load of staff here who are experts in the field. Um, they, um, the, the team includes specialists in safety testing, photometry testing and certification. Um, basically, that means that we've got a whole dedicated uh, people here who are happy to help with most inquiries that we receive. Um, we offer a range of services from your standard luminaire safety testing um, to international testing such as UL for the North American market, as well as product performance testing, uh, as you'd expect. Mm. Uh, as well as being uh, an accredited test house, we're also a certification body. Um, that means that uh, uh, our customers who are, need access to international markets we have the, uh, the solution for them basically to help them do that as well. Um, uh, one of our biggest investments is actually in our photometry lab. Um, we've got several integrating spheres, a dedicated lamp room that we do uh, live testing in, and of course our VISO and LMT Gonia photometers. The LMT is uh, one of our, uh, it's quite the beast, and it uh, takes a large proportion of the building. Um, and was almost a half million pound investment on our part. So we're quite proud of that because uh, of all the capabilities this brought us into uh, for us to supply the testing that we need. Um, uh, being an accredited test house, we also carry out a fair amount of luminaire performance testing. Um, this includes your typical lumen output measurements that you, you'd expect, as well as color measurements um, and uh, distri light distribution measurements as well. Uh, a lot of customers expect. Uh, in recent years, however, uh, customers have been looking for more and more cost-effective ways of assessing their products. Um, budgets are getting tighter, um, so that means that they're keen to find a way of assessing the entire product range without having to test every single unit. 
So this has now uh, led us on to our partnership with 42 Partners. Um, both uh, Richard and Ian bring over 30 years experience in photometry and uh, lighting design. So who else would be a better place to help us do this? Um, we work in collaboration with them now, um, and we've actually put together a photometry offering that's tailored to our customers' uh, needs. So we're um, so we're hoping that uh, the the new the, the new designed offering will give a much better service to our customers. So on that note, I'd like to introduce Richard, um, who will explain a bit more about the service we're offering. Thanks, Tarek. Uh, thanks, John, for the introduction, and Tarek for that uh, introduction. Um, I'm here today to explain to you um, how this new take on the photometry service we're doing in conjunction with the LIA is going to work and hopefully what benefits it will bring to the people using the LIA laboratories for photometric testing. Um, so we've got to understand, first of all, why people need photometric data. Um, photometric data isn't an intellectual exercise. Uh, it's a tool and it's a tool that designers and end users of lighting need to do their job. So if we can present the data to them in a way that is useful to them, then that gives them a better value service at the end of the day. Um, there are two main reasons for people needing photometric data. There's quite a lot of photometric data that happens during the development process of a product. Um, and in this case, it's quite likely that we'll take the direct readings from the photometric equipment that we're using, either a Goni or photometer or an integrator, and pass that directly along to the client. The client wants to see that data sort of warts and all, so he can see any imperfections in his um, prototypes, so he can help it develop um, the optical systems within the lighting so that he can get a feel for how he can improve the product. If everything's fine, then he'll go through a process of making some maybe pre-production samples um, and he might submit those for testing. And then he'll come to the point where he wants actual production data off samples that he is submitting so that he can release that data to his clients. Now, that data is data that comes directly from the Gonio photometer or the integrator. And at that point, it's not really suitable for commercial purposes. So the point of this service is to take that data and actually correct it and tweak it in ways so that it gives the designers and the end users a better chance of being able to use that data in a good commercial manner to satisfy their needs so that they can do designs, they can get those designs verified so they can get products specified. Um, this is probably the vast majority of all data. The development end of data tends to be at the front end. Um, it tends to be a relatively small amount of data. The vast majority of stuff is to cover products that are on the market that manufacturers want to sell to customers, designers want to use in designs, and end users want to put in their buildings. Um, we've got to figure out why we need to correct the raw data. Um, now, I'm going to go a bit off piste here and mention the Large Hadron Collider. Um, it's probably the biggest piece of measurement equipment in the world. It's incredibly sophisticated. It has hundreds of scientists crawling around it, all with PhDs and advanced degrees. But it doesn't actually collect that much raw data. It collects an awful lot of stuff that they don't want every time that they turn it on. And they have to apply masses of statistical measures, corrections to every bit of data they correct. And after they've done hundreds of experiments and applied statistical resources to it and compared data from hundreds of different tests, they eventually come out with this conclusion that they found a Higgs boson. Now, nobody's seen a Higgs boson, but we do know that it exists. Now, I'm not qualified to give you all the causes of noise measurement and bias in the Large Hadron Collider. But I've been in the photometry game long enough to tell you the problems in measurement in any Gonio photometer or integrator based measurement system. Um, we'll have a little game here of spot the unicorn. Um, it's a little game I invented just to put this over. Um, we all know that you know unicorns don't exist, um, but there are quite a few things that are like unicorns in photometric data collection. There's no such thing as a unicorn, but there's also no such thing as a zero refractance room. Any, any gonio photometer that's placed in a room that's making intensity measurements on a luminaire 
will pick up stray light. It's inevitable. You cannot have a zero reflectance surface. So there is stray light bouncing around the room. That enters the detector and it appears in the measurements. Um, there's no such thing as a Gonio photometer that doesn't have bits of the kit that gets in the way or reflects even more stray light into the detector at certain angles. Um, the big problem with testing luminaires is that they're sometimes big, heavy pieces of kit. And even when they're small, light pieces of kit, they don't hang in midair by their own so we can run a detector around them. You have to actually support them with pieces of equipment. Those pieces of equipment bounce light and some of it gets into the detector. Some of it gets into the detector at some angles and some of it gets into the detector at other angles. You need to qualify those things so that you can tune out that stuff that is essentially noise in the system. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect intensity or spectral detector system. All detector systems have problems, whether it be linearity, whether it be noise, whether it be sensitivity. You can list all the problems with any detector that you put on any piece of equipment. And of course, we can quantify those and we can apply corrections to it. Um, there's no such thing as um, a Gonio photometer room that sits at 25 degrees C from top to bottom, side to side, all day long. And most of the luminaires that we test are in some way slightly thermally sensitive. Some of them might be very thermally sensitive, but others aren't quite so thermally sensitive. But the output of a luminaire, as you move it around in a big room, will change slightly. And what you want is a system that takes out that changes. Um, now, we can correct for all of these unicorns if we know where they are and if we can quantify them in some way. We might have to make some extra measurements to quantify some of the errors and biases that you find in them. But once we can quantify those, we can apply corrections to them and we can eliminate them. Now, there is another problem that the actual luminaires that we test are generally not perfect. They're made by human beings. Um, and especially if they're pre-production types, then they can have, they can be hand built. Even when we get to production standard of um, luminaires, they're not all made perfectly. I know this will come as a surprise to some people. The, um, the lighting industry is not renowned for making absolutely perfect systems every time. There are minor variations in them. So there's no such thing as a perfect reflector lens or prismatic controller. They all have minute variations in them. Sometimes they have quite large variations in them. Reflectors in particular that are made from pieces of shiny metal that are bent into shape, or sometimes they're vacuum metalized bits of plastic. They can distort, they can, they can move slightly in transit, whatever. You will get various imperfections in the optical system. There's no such thing as a perfect LED. Um, Anybody who believes that every LED you buy from the manufacturer exactly conforms to all the nominal data on the LED data sheet in lumen output, in color, in thermal sensitivity, in forward volt drop against current drive, and all the other factors that affect an LED's performance, there is no such thing as a standard perfect nominal LED. All the LEDs that you put into a practical product will slightly differ from each other. There's also no such thing as a perfect LED driver. Every driver that you pick up off the shelf has probably got 30 to 40 different components in it from transformers, inductors, capacitors, resistors, whatever else is in there. And they all vary slightly. So again, a nominal driver that's supposed to deliver 350 milliamps constant current to an LED system might be anywhere between 345 and 355, or it could be an even wider tolerance than that. So all of those are imperfect and add to the imperfect nature of each test that you take. Now, even if you took your perfect LED and mounted it behind a perfect optical system and drove it with a perfect driver, you'd also put it in a production body. And the production body probably isn't going to line the LED up perfectly with a fantastic optical system you've got. So just by putting all those components together, you're introducing more subnominal things into the path. Um, so any luminaire that you test is not going to be the perfect luminaire. It's going to be a luminaire that will have slight imperfections in it. Um, most of these will affect a thing that we call uh, the symmetry of the luminaire. Most luminaires that we, we test have some degree of symmetry. 
these things throw that symmetry out of whack. And if you took that raw data and put it into a design, it would show this lack of symmetry. Um, symmetry is very important in, in lighting. If you take the example I've got there of some raw data from a disymmetric fitting, that little green rectangle in the middle is the uh, plan view of the luminaire from above. It's supposed to have um, a symmetric output both through its long axis as a plane of symmetry and through its short axis as a plane of symmetry. Um, the raw data we collect off a Gonio photometer is likely to be similar to that sort of thing that we get on the left hand side of the screen there. Now, OK, it doesn't look too bad, but if you put that into a lighting design scheme, especially with the computer systems we have these days, your lighting design system will be slightly skewed because the data hasn't been symmetricized. Now, it's very easy to take that data and correct it. In that case, what we do is we'd average each of the quadrants of that luminaire so that they were all equal to each other. So we take the, the um, data from the 0 to 90 quadrant in azimuth and we'd average it to the 0 180 quadrant and we'd average that to the 9270 quadrant we'd average that to the 27360 quadrant and we'd end up with one typical quadrant and we'd reproduce that four times so we show a perfectly symmetrical file now that's not a thing that will ever exist but that's the thing that the designer needs to put into his data so he can show the client what effect he's going to have because when you put 20 luminaires in a room it's the average effect of the 20 luminaires that you want and you want it unbiased by any particular fault in any particular luminaire. So symmetry and correcting symmetry becomes very important to us in producing commercial photometric data that people can use in designs. It happens with all types of luminaires, disymmetric luminaires, linear luminaires, um, modules, all the sorts of stuff that we see in offices generally tend to be disymmetric. Um, spotlights, high bays, things like that are rotationally symmetric, i.e. they have one plane, you can take any one plane through the fitting and you can average all the other planes and you can produce one plane of data which describes that fitting completely. Street lights, it's incredibly important. Um, if you put a street light on the top of a column, it shines two beams of light up and down the road. Um, now, if you've got a difference in output due to a slightly imperfect luminaire from the light it shines up the road to down the road, that can drastically affect the spacing of the luminaire when you put it into a scheme. And these days, commercially, street lighting luminaires are chosen by people for contracts for the, to the extent in which they'll space. The economies of street lighting are based on intercolumn distance. You figure out that you've got a road and you're gonna light five kilometers of road, if you can change the spacing between columns from 40 meters to 45 meters, and it's about a thousand pounds to plant a column, figure out how many thousands of pounds that saves you. And you can rapidly figure out why people in street lighting are so obsessed with intercolumn distance. Having non symmetricized data that can show up the faults between one side and the other, which it shouldn't really be there, can drastically affect the economics of street lighting. So it becomes very important in lots of different fields. Um, what we do with the new service that we're doing for the LIA is that we take this wonderfully accurate data from the fantastic equipment the LIA have, and we do a few extra tests. We'll take a test to see what the stray light bouncing around the room is. We'll take a few more uh, random tests around to see what sort of um, effects different angles of light into the detection equipment have, and we'll apply those corrections to the data. Then we'll look at the type of luminaire and we'll decide what symmetry it should have. Then we'll run a nice little test and we'll go, are the planes of symmetry in that luminaire that we've tested close enough that when we symmetricize the data, when we artificially make it symmetric, we're not overcorrecting? If we're overcorrecting at that point, we've got to stop and say to the client, look, the sample that you've sent us isn't good enough. Can you send me a better sample? And it might be that this shows up some sort of fault in your production system. It might not. It might just be a random effect. Um, but we can intervene at that point to give the client a bit more data as to what he needs to do on his production process. It's quite often that we've spotted things in luminaires that have been put into production that the client's not spotted up until that point. So 
once we've done that test that we can validly make the corrections, we'll make the corrections to the data and produce a symmetry sized set of intensity data. We'll do the same with the data in terms of color and we'll do the same with the data in terms of lumen output from any integrating spheres that we've used in the process. Sometimes we don't use integrating spheres. It's perfectly possible to take the intensities from the Gonio photometer and providing that they're calibrated, which they are in the LIA system, we can derive the lumen output from that. We can put it in an integrator and we can check the two systems against each other. And that gives us a nice backstop to prove that our system's repeatable and accurate over a long period of time. So all these things we can do to verify the data and make sure that the data we're producing is typical of what that type of luminaire should do when it's sold into the client's um, uh, for, for a client to use. From the, all that data, everything else is derived. Um, color temperature, CRA, utilization factor, to, uh, UF tables, um, spacing tables, cone diagrams, beam widths, flux fractions, efficacy, all the computer data files are actually derived from those principal intensity measurements and the principal lumen output and spectral power distribution measurements that we make. So we really only make a small series of accurate but corrected um, basic measurements. And most of the data we're producing is derived from those three principal types of measurements. Um, just a quick note here, I mean, not all of that is useful for every type of fitting. Um, a beam width diagram for a street light is about as much use as a chocolate fire guard. So obviously we wouldn't produce that and send it out to the client. So it's absolutely no use to you. Um, one of the things that we'll send out to standard um, is an LDT file. So when we're talking about computer data for um, luminaires, there are two common file types in use. Um, there's an LDT file, an EU LUMDAT file, which is the European system. And there's an IES file, which is the American system. Now, IES is short for IESNA, which is the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America. Um, now, I have to ask the question why people in Europe want IES files. Um, and there's no real reason why they do. There's a good reason why you don't want an IES file in that it's actually a fairly inferior file system to an LDT file, an EU LUMDAT file, which is the European system. The big difference, there are others, which we'll come on to in a moment, is that there's only one set of dimensional information in an IES file. An IES file has to describe the luminous area, the luminous dimensions, the fitting only. In an EU LUMDAT file, an LDT file, we got two sets of dimensions. We have the overall dimensions and we have the luminous dimensions. And those are two separate sets of data we put into an LDT file. Now, if you take the luminaire that I've got there, which is some form of round cylindrical downlight, which has a bezel around it, it has a physical height, it has a physical dimension which is greater than its luminous dimension, a correctly formatted IES file, when you put it into Relux or Dialux, other lighting design programs are available, I should say at this point, um, you get this infinitely thin, thin flat disk because that's the only thing you can describe in an IES file. If you want your products to look in any way realistic and you want your designers to know whether your luminaire is going to bang into the air conditioning unit next to it, an LDT file is useful to you. An IES file is fairly unuseful to you at that point. So our standard offer is we'll send out an LDT file. If you want an IES file, we'll produce one for you, but you're going to have to pay a bit extra for it because we don't really want to produce them. Um, symmetry becomes very important with street lights. Um, I've already explained something about um, symmetry in street lights, but there's another problem with IES files, particularly in street lighting. Um, this varies, uh, this sort of veers into the area of um, geekery really, but um, the US IES photometric axis system is 90 degrees rotated from the European system. So I hope you can see on the diagram there that um, the azimuth axis 0 180 in the IES system is rotated 90 degrees from the European system. You often get a diagram when you put them into a program like Relux where the street light is wrongly aligned with the data. That street light should be an elongated 
rectangle sitting on top of the column and it should produce the two beams of light. Because it's been um, measured in the IES system, although you can turn the data around, programs often interpret that wrong and leave the dimensions one way around and the data the other way around um, in relation to the, to the intensity data in the file. So that you end up with a street light that actually looks wrong on top of the column. Now, okay, you can say that doesn't matter particularly, but it's not showing your products in the best light. You should, as a manufacturer, be putting your products uh, in front of the customers in the way that's going to encourage them to use them to the best of their abilities. Um, when it comes to um, testing sequences, Tarek's already um, alluded to this, there is often a lot of pre-work that we can do to help you get a maximum um, bang per buck out of your photometry. Um, these days, it's quite common for a range of LED luminaires to have one optical system, um, but it will have maybe three different LEDs in it of three different color temperatures. So you'll end up with a 27K uh, um, LED, a three, three and a half thousand K and a 4,000 K LED. You might drive those at three different drive currents, 350 milliamps, 750 milliamps, and 1050 milliamps. That's quite common. To cover all that, you need nine sets of data. But you've only got one distribution because all the LEDs are physically identical. Yes, they have different color temperatures. That's just the phosphor. Yes, they're driven, driven at different drive currents, so they'll have different lumen outputs, but that's nothing to do with the intensity data. So we can take one set of standardized intensity data and we can do enough testing of the color variance and the drive current variance to get you nine sets of data at a much lower cost than doing nine separate tests. Now, what that will mean is that when you ring us up and ask us to do a single photometric test, we're going to go, do you think that, that is that luminaire part of a range of luminaires? And if it is, we'll say, well, if you'd actually like to cover the range, if we can understand how the range is put together, we can put a least cost route together, which will give you all the data that you need with a minimal amount of testing. And of course, the minimal amount of testing means the minimum cost. So it's always going to be cheaper to have a range of luminaires tested in one hit than to pick off individual luminaires and do nine individual tests. That's the most expensive way to do it. Um, photometry, if you've got a properly constructed laboratory with good procedures in it, um, we can actually stream that um, test sequence through the laboratory more efficiently. We can be doing a lumen output test on item one while we've got the other one on the Gonio. And that essentially means we can use two pieces of equipment at once. We can pass that saving on to you. So all of this makes sense if we consult with you in the early inquiry stage of your photometry testing, talk to you about what your needs are, talk to you about what your requirements are, and actually give you the data you need for the least possible disruption and the least possible cost. That concludes the major points of my presentation. Um, thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks for Tarek for the introduction. I'll now hand back over to John Bullock. Uh, Richard, thank you very much for that. Um, fascinating stuff. Quite challenging, I think, that um, we've all got so used to the idea that you test a real thing. And it seems to be now that we're testing not quite a unicorn, but something also that exists in a different place because you are now measuring something that you haven't measured, which has got its own fascination. Right, we're going to go into, into a, a, a Q&A. We've invited uh, Stephen Biggs from Tamlight, um, if you like, the, the, the manufacturer's voice, uh, the kind of people who this, this new service is aimed at. Steve, it's, uh, it's good to see you. Um, the, you, you've just got my sort of comment off the top of my head. What do you reckon to all of this? Thanks, John. Yeah, and thanks for the presentation, Richard. Um, yeah, so Richard, we've experienced firsthand in conversations we've had of um, when we've got files back from yourselves, we use the LIA, as you know, for all our photometric testing. Um, so we see it firsthand where we see interreflection within the files, where you get the small bump at the top of the files also when they're non symmetrized 
So how much are you actually playing with that data when it comes off the gonio to put it in a more, um, you know, a, a true LDT file, as you like, as what manufacturers will want to produce their data and show it to, to our clients? I think this is where experience comes in. Um, if you've got a luminaire that is supposed to perform in a particular way, and, and one of the things we, we like to do is understand from the clients what the luminaire is supposed to do. So I suppose one of the things we bring to this is, is myself and my business partner, Ian Taylor, we've been hanging around the industry for a long time. People have been trying to get rid of us, but we won't go away. Um, and in that time, we've seen all the different types of, of luminaires. We've been involved in lighting design. We were the distributors for Relux for a long time. So we've seen it from the software point of view. So we can look at a luminaire and discuss what it's supposed to do. Now, when you put it on the Gonio, if it does that, and it does it with a reasonable degree of accuracy, but with some slight imperfections, we can go, okay, that's a file we can correct. Now, if you bring me a disymmetric luminaire in, you know, a typical office light with, with, with a nice disymmetric pattern on it, and it produces a beam over into the left-hand corner of the room, I'm gonna go at this point, that's not correctable data. I can't make that luminaire do what you want it to do. So the, the corrections we're making are small, generally, but they're quite important in making your data usable for the designer. Yeah, thanks. We, we shouldn't be making, yeah, we shouldn't be making massive corrections. If we're making massive corrections, either there's something wrong with the detector system or there's something, something slightly off with the luminaire that we've got for test. Yeah, we, we have that same thing, really. We, when we get a file in, usually from the LIA in the past, I then have a guy that manages our Relux database um, go over the files and, you know, quite a lot of work internally for us to symmetrize the file and also, you know, take out any imperfections in the file. Uh, but often again, with, as you mentioned there, with different um, product types, different sectors, we've had it before with floodlights where you will, you, you know, until you put it into Relux and look where the actual um, LDC is, is being you know, emitted from the product is when you can actually see that the, the file is tied incorrectly to the model that we're using. Um, do you mind if I, I just come in on this one? Uh, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea that um, we are now talking about delivering data that hasn't actually been measured. Uh, and I get why. And I, I get the idea that, that, that raw data becomes, if you like, useful data within tolerances. But I'm also conscious that I once had a, a, a scheme um, binned by the consulting engineer because one of the one 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 of the calculate one of the calculations, if you like, in in the in the uh, illuminance plot was less than what he considered to be the minimum design uh, figures. He, he promised the, the client, uh, uh, over right the way through the space, he'd promised the client an illuminance. Stupid man, but that's what he'd done. One of the numbers was below that. And I just wonder whether we have, how we deal, if we've got a situation where we know that the photometric data hasn't been, is not raw, and yet what actually gets installed are raw luminaires. And if we've got a very, very pedantic consulting engineer or a pedantic client who goes around with their, with their uh, illuminance meter and says, I haven't got enough light here. And you look at it and you go, you're 10 locks under what you're meant to be. He said, well, that's not what I asked for. If that ends up in a court of law, where do we stand on the kind of data that we are now talking about producing, Richard? I I asked this question um, a couple of weeks ago to um, the esteemed Mr. Bohannon, the president of the SLL. Um, and one of the things that's always slightly bugged me about the lighting industry is that the tolerances are not clear. Um, in every aspect of engineering, you, you, you have a tolerance. So um, if, you, if you make an M5 screw, an M5 bolt, it should fit into all the M5 nuts. But the M5 nuts aren't all the same and the M5 bolts aren't all the same, but within tolerance, they all fit together. Um, the level of certainty on that is 
99 point whatever percentage it is and like the thousandth the, the thousandth pair of nuts and bolts you get together they won't quite screw in or they'll be tight um now we've never really had that in the lighting industry we, we've never had to my knowledge an intelligent discussion about this now i did ask mr bohannon and maybe he'll watch this and come back to me again um what the tolerances are now the official line is that if you look up in EN12464, an office lighting specification, and it says 500 lux average minimum, it's 500 lux average minimum. 499.9 average lux minimum is not acceptable, 500 is. Now, the, they did, he did mention a top limit. I, it's not written down anywhere, but he said 10%. So if you're aiming for 500 lux, and don't forget that's average, you've got to have 500 lux average, Minus nothing, plus 10 as your limits. Now, don't forget, we also have a uniformity on that. And the uniformity of an office spec off the top of my head, 0.6, I think it is. So don't forget, we can have a minimum of 300 lux. Now, that's way, way, way bigger than anything we're doing with the data. Massively bigger. We're talking about altering intensities by a few percent either side of the symmetry line to get them back in. We're talking about taking out stray light and dark error, which might be one, two, in extreme cases, three to 4% of the total flux that's bouncing around the room could be stray light that we don't want into the detector. So the actual tolerances we've got in the lighting scheme are way, way, way wider than the small amount of correction we're applying to the data. That's why I say it's quite important to have an experienced eye on it because you can look at the data and go, that's correctable, that's not correctable. If it's not correctable, we'll ring up the client and go, I'm sorry, the, the sample you've sent us, there's, there's something wrong with it. We've got to have an intelligent discussion about, about this, about, about how are you going to send me a good sample? Okay. The, you know, there's never a luminaire manufacturer who, who doesn't make a lemon on, you know, four o'clock on a Friday afternoon, the girl on the production line drops the reflector looks around, see if the supervisor's there and still puts it in the body and sends it out. If you happen to pick that one from photometry, you're screwed. You probably wouldn't notice if that one in 20, and if it wasn't a, a gross defect, went into an office somewhere. Yeah. Steve, yeah, you might I, question I, that. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so re very relevant, really, to Richard, what you were saying with, with street lighting. You know, if you've got a, a fitting that's very wide, but only slightly forward throwing, um, for certain road applications, if you were to spin that by 180 degrees effectively um, in the design, you would still get a light level, of course, on the road that you're looking to light, but with very different readings to what you're looking to achieve. So someone who doesn't know the product potentially, um, you know, they get some data taken from the LDT file, they push it out into the Relux database, could potentially push it out incorrectly um, and undersell themselves commercially as well. Yeah, this this, this is another problem, and, and this isn't really a photometry problem. Um, um, this is going to come as a surprise to a lot of people. The big lighting design programs out there interpret photometric data in slightly different ways. <laughs> there's, there's never been a standard that isn't interpretable, and the production of photometric data is exactly the same. Um, I think... It's got a lot better over the past few years. I think at the peak of our time in 42 Partners, we were producing a different file for Relux than we were for Dialux because Dialux and Relux interpreted the LDT format differently. And we had a Dialux format file that we knew they interpreted in a particular way. And we had a Relux format file, which we knew Relux interpreted in a particular way. Now, a lot of that has disappeared over, over the years, but you do, do still get anomalies. Um, there's, there's a classic one which you can still find in Relux that the ray tracer in Relux is derived from the radiance core and it actually applies IES symmetry to a street light. And if you put the street light into Relux and design it and then ray trace it, you'll find that the results on the road are 90 degrees out in the ray tracing as opposed to the radiosity version, which is the standard method of calculation. All this sort of stuff still exists. Um, the average person never finds it. Um, it's my job to know where it all is and try and figure out how to get around it. Yeah, we do a lot with tying uh, full 3D geometry files to our LDT files as well. 
to ensure that light is being distributed in the way that the product intends to distribute it as a real life scenario, for instance? Yeah, I, I mean, this is probably a discussion for, for another day, but um, we, we're probably getting to the point where we can kill radiosity as a calculation method um, because radiosity, the, the principal method that Relux uses, Dialux uses, AGI32 uses, all the big programs use, is no better really. It's just a lot of the calculation I used to do on the slide rule in the 1980s, um, which is the Lumen method calculation. It's still working on transfer functions, bulk flux transfer from diffuse reflectance. It's the same maths that's been around from, from the 60s. Now, now we're at a point in, with computers where we can probably junk that and go to ray tracing. But if we're gonna to go to ray tracing, somebody's got to program in a BRDF file for the road surface, the column, and all the rest of things around there. And lighting design is gonna get really way more complicated very quickly. I mean, we have enough trouble getting reflection factors out of the architects anyway. So we guess 80, 60, 20 <laughs> and, and hope that it's about right. Um, but if we're going to go to a much more accurate method of calculation, which is what ray tracing does, then one, we've got to get a new file format. We've probably got to use ray files in lighting design programs. Now, an LDT file is about 5K. Um, a decent ray file set for Illuminaire is probably going to run to 500 meg. <laughs> so, you know, we've got all sorts of things um, going on here, which, which, are, which are odd in the lighting industry, and they've always been slightly odd in the lighting industry. But what we do works, and it works reasonably well. Yeah, yeah. So last question for me, Richard, uh, as an industry, of course, we're always up against time, um, <laughs> special projects. Um, what, what sort of lead times are we looking at out of the LIA for, for return of photometric files? Well, if we can get this stuff streamed as we want it to, and, and we're, we're improving the processes um, in the laboratory all the time, there should be no reason why you shouldn't wait more than 10 working days is what we'd like to get to. Now, if we get a massive influx of stuff, then we've got to throw a resource at it. And, th and there's always going to be a lag if we get a massive influx. But we're going to try to work to a two week turnaround, i.e. 10 working days. No, that's, that's great. Great, well, thanks very much, guys. Um, I think that's been fascinating. From my perspective as, as a designer, it, it's almost like it's, a, it's, it's like opening that door that's marked secret, do not go in here because you're not going to understand what they're talking about anyway. But once you do open that door, it is absolutely fascinating. Um, a, a, a few just practical things. Uh, it, this service is, is available now, Richard? Yes. We issued the new price list three weeks ago now, Tariq. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it was three weeks ago. Um, so we've been trying to... Um, get all our ducks in a row so we could, if you like, formally launch it. And, and this is the first part of the formal launching of the new LIA photometry, commercial photometry service. Okay. So what we'll do at the end of this is that we'll put up the uh, contact information. So anybody who wants to find out more about it can get in touch direct with uh, presumably somebody at the LIA, Richard, or do you want everybody to ring you? Uh, the inquiries go into the LIA in exactly the same way. The only difference now is that they're streamed into 42 partners, mainly my business partner, Ian Taylor, to take a look at first and then advise on the path we should take going through there. And then we've got our fingers in all the pies in terms of the internal systems in the photometry lab to make sure that, that we, can, we can get the data in a format that the, that the clients need. Okay, that's fine. Um... Gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, Richard, for a fantastic presentation. Stephen, for coming in and casting a professional eye over it. And Tariq, for giving us the, uh, the opening uh, profile of what the LIA is up to. And I think we're all very, very excited about what the LIA are now up to, because this sounds like it's going to be a great service for everybody concerned. So um, thanks to everyone for um, being here and for staying with us and I hope it's useful to you and we'll see you all out there. Thank you very much.